Hello. In this last lesson of Unit 4, we will briefly discuss waters of the sea. Sea water. What do we know about sea water? Well, we know that 70% of the Earth's surface is covered with sea water. Now, if you look at this picture, it is very obvious two-thirds of the Earth's surface is covered with water. Now, ocean is a single continuous body of water on the surface of the Earth. Now, unlike what many people think that we sort of divide the ocean into various parts, actually the ocean is a single body of water. The picture actually shows that. Is that right? All right. Although there is only one single ocean, specific regions have been given names for convenience. And what are those names? The three principal regions are the Atlantic Ocean, the Pacific Ocean, and the Indian Ocean. And you can see from this picture that of the three regions, the Pacific seems to be the largest. The Pacific Ocean is the largest, covering 180 million square kilometers. And its average depth is 3.9 kilometers. Well, if you know what the height of Everest is, that's almost as deep. You can see the average depth is 3.9 kilometer means that there are parts which are deeper than 5 kilometers. The Atlantic Ocean is the second largest, that is 107 million square kilometers with an average depth of 3.3 kilometer. And finally the Indian Ocean covers 74 million square kilometers and an average depth of 3.8 kilometer. And also we talk about sea. What is a sea? What is the difference between an ocean and a sea? Actually a sea is part of an ocean. If you look at the Mediterranean Sea, the Gulf of Mexico, or the Caribbean Sea, they are all parts of the Atlantic. So a sea is actually part of an ocean. What is the nature of sea water? What is sea water? What is the difference between sea water and fresh water? Well, sea water has a lot of dissolved minerals in it. Now, much of the dissolved minerals in seawater are from degassing of water vapor and other gases from molten rock. When Earth solidified from its molten state, the degassing, the gases that were, that were allowed to escape when the lava finally solidified, now, all those materials are dissolved in the seawater. A lot of minerals are dissolved in there. And here is a table of some of the minerals that are dissolved in seawater. Chlorine, 55.3% of seawater is chlorine. Sodium is 30.8%. You can see most of the dissolved minerals are sodium and chlorine. Sodium chloride is the salt, is that right? So most of it is the salt. And then you have magnesium, sulfur, calcium, potassium, and so on. There are many minerals and chemicals that are dissolved in seawater. Now, rivers carry large amounts of suspended and dissolved minerals to the ocean. When rain and wind breaks down rocks, you know, rocks are made of minerals. All those small particles of minerals are washed and carried to the sea. That is another way of increasing the mineral content of seawater. 
and the dissolved materials are left behind when water evaporates. You see, water is continuously evaporating. And when water evaporates, only fresh water becomes water vapor. All the dissolved minerals are left behind. If you want to know more about it, take some salt water and heat it on a stove. You can see when it boils and evaporates away, the salt will be left behind. If you take seawater and put it on a flat bed and allow the water to evaporate, what is left behind will be salt. In fact, there are many places even now which produce salt like that from seawater. Now, some of the dissolved materials such as iron, magnesium, and phosphorus are removed by organisms to produce shells and bones. See, organisms that live in the sea produce their shells and bones from these dissolved minerals. That means there is a systematic way of removing these dissolved minerals. Now, as more minerals are added by rivers and streams washing into the seas, carrying away their loads of dissolved minerals. That will help increase the mineral content. At the same time, the animals in the sea will be using it up, produce their own bones and shells, so they use it up. Now, that means that the total amount of minerals dissolved in seawater actually hasn't changed because more gets added at the same time it gets taken away by these animals. So other dissolved materials make sediments that settle to the ocean floor. Studies on fossils show that composition of seawater has changed very little in the last 600 million years. And this is the reason for it. Although Minerals get added due to the washing in of streams and rivers, bringing in more supplies of minerals. They're actually being systematically removed by animals. The amount of dissolved salts in seawater is measured as the salinity. So salinity is a measure of the dissolved minerals in seawater. And salinity is defined as the mass of salt dissolved in 1,000 gram of seawater. You see, it is parts per 1,000. And look at the symbol we use. You know what percent is. Percent is a part in a hundred. Now, a percent has a zero on either side of the slanted line. But per thousand. This symbol is per thousand. How many parts per thousand? One zero to the left and two zeros to the right. For example, 42 per thousand means 42 gram of dissolved salt in 100 gram of seawater. That's the meaning in there. Now, salinity varies slightly from place to place and around the world. You know, Dead Sea, for example, has got large amounts of dissolved materials in it. Its density is higher than the density of water elsewhere. Now, and also varies somewhat in the seasons, affected by temperature and precipitation. Means when there is a lot of rain falling, rain is fresh water. That will change the salinity of water. Now, whereas evaporation will increase the salinity, is that right? Because when water evaporates, it leaves behind salt. So a lot of rain will decrease the salinity, whereas a lot of evaporation will increase the salinity. The salinity of seawater ranges from about 32 to 36 per thousand. The concentration of seawater is increased by the concentration of minerals in seawater is increased by what? By evaporation 
at the formation of ice because when ice forms it's only fresh water that is used for the formation of ice so in a region of an ocean if there is large scale formation of ice caps that means the salinity in that region will increase because ice is only fresh water and all the salt that were contained in that fresh water is dumped into the remaining water that will increase the salinity so the concentration of minerals in seawater will be increased by evaporation and also by the formation of ice and the concentration of seawater is decreased by heavy precipitation mainly the for the rainfall and the snowfall will affect the salinity in addition to dissolved salt seawater also contains dissolved gases what kind of gases are dissolved in seawater well seawater which is immediately in contact with the atmosphere will have a lot of oxygen and nitrogen dissolved in it near the surface dissolved gases are mainly nitrogen and oxygen in almost the same proportion you see them in the air what's the proportion you see nitrogen and oxygen in the air 70% nitrogen and about 21% oxygen now it contains dissolved carbon dioxide carbon dioxide dissolves readily in water you see because it reacts with seawater to produce carbonic acid in fact most of the soda water that we drink has carbon dioxide dissolved in it it has carbonic acid carbon dioxide will dissolve very easily in water now water temperature and salinity have an influence on how much gas can be dissolved in seawater tell me if you know from your experience will more gas dissolve in a liquid at high temperature or low temperature well if you heat water what you see have you seen when you heat water bubbles begin to form what are those bubbles those bubbles are dissolved air inside water escaping that means when you increase the temperature the amount of gas dissolved will be less the dissolved gases will escape whereas if you decrease the temperature more gas will dissolve in water so water temperature and salinity have an influence on how much gas can be dissolved in seawater more gas will dissolve at cold temperatures and low salinity now at a depth of about 80 meter there is insufficient light for photosynthesis to take place that means at that depth algae and plankton are found above that depth because in order that algae and plankton may survive they need oxygen is that right and below a depth of 80 meter where they need sunlight there is no sunlight so that photosynthesis cannot happen so algae and plankton will not survive in places where light cannot reach and to a depth of about 80 meter beyond a depth of 80 meter light rarely reaches therefore these algae and plankton can be found only above that level now below this depth there is more dissolved carbon dioxide and less oxygen the oxygen poor deep sea water eventually circulate back to the surface due to difference in the type of water movement we will talk about the different types of water movement as we go on so very often gradually the water which is starved of oxygen will come to the surface will become rich in oxygen and will go back actually the waters of sea are in a constant continuous state of motion 
Let's talk about the movement of seawater. What are the, uh, the seawater movements and what are the causes for that? Now, one of the major reasons for the movement of sea and ocean currents are winds. Winds and ocean current. In fact, winds play a great role in producing ocean currents. Winds are primary force causing seawater movement at the surface of the ocean. As the sun heats up the air at the equator, we, we told about that, is that right in the last class or the class before that? As the sun heats up the equator, the air at the equator becomes less dense, it rises and spreads to the north and south and about 30 degrees north and 30 degrees south they sink and then get drawn back to the equator what is the name of uh, that we talked about this so eventually it becomes cool so as the sun heats up the air at the equator it becomes less dense and rises and eventually it becomes cool enough to fall at about 30 degrees north and 30 degrees south and this creates a three cell wind pattern and these three cells there are three main cells of wind patterns they call Hartley cells feral cells and polar cells well, here I have an illustration of that. Now, the air at the equator, the air at the equator becomes less denser because they receive lots of heat. Now, when that rises, so the air at the equator becomes less denser and rise. As it rises, it moves to the north and to the south. So 30 degrees north and 30 degrees south, it begins to sink. And in that region, that's what we call the Hartley cell. And then the sinking air, the movement of the sinking air in this region is what causes the feral cell. And then the motion of polar air causes the polar cell. So, there are three main types of wind cells. They are Hartley cells, feral cells, and polar cells. And these cells of wind play a very prominent role in the motion of seawater. Now, the regions near the equator receive more heat from the sun than other regions. I'm sure you remember this diagram, the intertropical convergence zone. Heated air at the equator rises, creating a low pressure at the equator, which then pulls in air from the north and the south. Cold air flows into the equator, causing the tropical easterlies. And it is the tropical easterlies that we call the Hartley cells. Now, this is responsible for the three wind cells, Hartley, Ferrell, and the polar cells. And these three main cells of wind are responsible for the transport of ocean water. The Earth's surface winds are influenced by the rotation of the Earth. You know the Coriolis effect we talked about? The Coriolis effect also affects the Earth's surface. Now here, the Coriolis effect produces a, you can see, a clockwise rotation of water on the surface of the Earth. The, as the Earth rotates, the surface of Earth moves under these three circulating cells. These Hartley cells, feral cells, and polar cells are big wind cells, and the Earth is rotating underneath these cells of wind, causing a drag on the surface. Now, this drag makes moving masses veer to the right at the north, 
and veer to the left at the south and that is what we call the Coriolis effect. We actually talked about it some time ago. Now, therefore, we are back with the three, the three cells, three wind cells. What are they? The northeast trade winds and the southeast trade winds produces one cell. The westerlies produces the second cell and the polar easterlies produces the third cell. So these winds that result from circulating cells and the Coriolis effect cause the trade winds, the westerlies and the polar easterlies. Now, the major ocean currents results from the winds, the presence of continental masses and the Coriolis effect. So, the motion of the ocean current is not only caused by the winds, but also the presence of land masses. Now, how does the presence of land mass influence the motion of seawater? Now, if there is a big land mass, as the wind blows and moves the water in one direction, when the water moves, it finds it's been blocked by a land mass. So, what does it then do? It will then deviate its path. We will talk about that as we move on. Now, the largest surface area subjected to surface winds is around the equator. So, it is the tropical easterlies that move the ocean water in a much pronounced way and that happens around the equator. So, around the equator is water is moved from east to west. Why? Because of the tropical easterlies, wind that blows from east to west. So, around the equator, the sea water is moved due to this wind cell from east to west, the trade winds. As this water hits a continental mass, you know, as the water moves from east to west, it finds the American land continent in its path. That means the motion of water is going to be arrested there. So as this water moves from east to west, it encounters this land mass. Is that right? The American continent there. And as a result, one part of the, of the water will go north and the other part will go south. So, as this water hits a continental mass on the western side of the ocean, it piles up and flows right. It piles up and flows right to the north, in the northern hemisphere, and then piles up and flows south on the southern hemisphere. So, you got a great big ocean current, water moving from the east, well, if I construct this is, now you see, what you see in the, in the recording, uh, the right will look like the left, is that right? Now suppose this is the American continent, water flowing from east to west encounters the landmass, and the water piles up and flows to the right on the northern hemisphere, and left on the southern hemisphere, creating a great big flow of water. Now, the warm tropical water is thus moved across the oceans from east to west and divided by the continent where it flows towards the poles. So, the winds make the water to flow from east to west and the continental mass then makes it flow towards the north and then towards the south. What happens? When it moves towards the north and south, you're going towards the polar region where water will cool down and sink. You see how that current is going to be again enhanced. The polar water which the, the, the water that reaches the polar region cools and sinks and the water that sinks then gets drawn to the equator. So the polar water 
is pulled towards the equator on the eastern side of the ocean. Is that right? Because it is from the east that the wind has been moving water to the west. So the water moves from east to west due to the Hartley cells. Then due to the landmass, it goes to the poles, to the north and south poles, where it cools down and sink. It then drawn back to the equator on the east. Now this creates a major surface ocean current, which are clockwise gyres. What are gyres? You know what gyrations are? Gyrations of a dancing person you know. In the same way, these currents produce great gyrations of water movement. Great gyres of northern hemisphere and counterclockwise in the southern hemisphere. So these gyres are, look at this, they are clockwise in the northern hemisphere and counterclockwise in the southern hemisphere. Let me see if I can, yes. Now here, you can see the equator, this is the equator there, and water moves from east to west, over here, and when water moves from east to west, it is blocked by landmass, which then piles up and flows to the north, over here, and south over here, producing these great big gyres. And the direction of these gyres or gyrations are clockwise at the north. Now look at the direction here. The clockwise, the direction of motion of the hand of the clock. And counterclockwise on the south. Now the Gulf Stream is about 100 kilometers wide and extend to a depth of one kilometer and move 75 million meter cube of water per second. Now that's the Gulf Stream. This is water moving from east to west here encounters the American continental mass and you have the gyres like this. That's the Gulf Stream. Now that moves how much? 75 million cubic meter of water per second producing that ocean current. The California current is weaker and broader. Now this is the California current. That happens in a much broader and large area. It is not, the current is not as strong as the Gulf Spring. Alright, so, so far we talked about the surface currents on the ocean caused by these various wind cells. There are other ocean currents that makes the waters move in the ocean. And one of the other prominent currents are density currents. What are density currents? Well, you know that cold water is denser than warm water Dense water will sink and warm water will rise. Also, when the salinity is more, its density is more. So change in the density of water will cause water to sink or rise, causing you have a density current. The density of seawater is influenced by three factors. The water temperature. Cold water will be denser than warm water. Well, the second factor is the salinity. More dissolved minerals in water means the density is more. It's also affected by suspended sediments. If there are too much suspended sediments, the density will be more. Now, major uh, subsurface currents in the oceans are most often due to the difference in the density of water masses. Now, a slow subsurface circulation of water develops with the sinking of cold water at the poles and the creeping across the ocean. You see, the major subsurface current is caused by the sinking of cold water at the poles and once the cold water sinks at the poles, 
it gradually creeps back to the equator where it rises, becomes very hot, becomes less denser, and that density current continues. So, the a slow subsurface circulation of water develops with the sinking of cold water at the poles and it's creeping across the ocean bottom with the meeting north polar water and the south polar water. You see how eventually the whole waters of the ocean get mixed. The water from the north pole and the water from the south pole both creeps across and meet at the equator and then the current continues. So ocean water is never steady in one place. Now salinity causes another kind of density current. For example, Mediterranean water has a higher salinity than water in the Atlantic and causes two separate currents that flow between the Mediterranean and the Atlantic. What is the two flows? The denser water from the Mediterranean flows at the bottom because the denser water sinks. So the denser water flows from the bottom of the Mediterranean into the Atlantic and the Atlantic water flows into the Mediterranean at the surface. You can see a big current set up there. From the Mediterranean, water flows at the sea bottom and from the Atlantic, the water flows into the Mediterranean on the surface. Another type of density current occurs when underwater sediments on a slope slides towards the ocean bottom, producing a current of muddy, turbid water called turbidity. Suppose there is a big slope underneath the ocean and the slope is full of mud and dirt. All of a sudden, the mud decides to slide down. That's turbidity. Well, another kind of uh, motion or movement of water in the sea is called upwelling. Upwelling. Now, it's a unique subsurface current that is actually vertical current bringing nutrient-rich water to the surface. Now, let me explain a very simple phenomenon to explain upwelling. I have a piece of paper, if you notice. Uh, now, I'm going to blow over this paper and see what happens. Now, watch what happens when I blow on this paper. <sighs> what happens? When I allow air to move very fast this way, the paper is pulled up. Now what happens is, fast movement of air can cause a low pressure. And that low pressure can pull up material into that low pressure region. Now this is exactly what upwelling is. Now upwelling happens in areas where winds blow on the surface with a relatively strong force. So, just the same way as I make air flow with a relatively strong force, the paper is brought up into that low pressure region. In the same way, when wind blows on the surface with a relatively strong force, it creates a low pressure which will bring up water from the bottom. And that is what we call upwelling. Now, upwelling areas have high biological productivity as nutrients enhance the food chain. Now, this creates nutrients being moved to areas where nutrients are scarce. And that enhances the biological productivity. In fact, there are areas where sardines can be caught in truckloads where this upwelling happens. Now, there are some, these are some areas where you got very pronounced effect of upwelling. And some of these areas are very good for fishing because of the biological productivity due to the mixing of the nutrient water. All right.
Let's now talk about ocean waves. Now, you know a fair understanding. You have a fair understanding of what a wave is. Now, what are some of the characteristics of waves? You know, a wave has a wavelength, it has a frequency, and so on. All right, now, what is the difference between waves in the ocean and tides in the ocean? We will talk about that. Well, waves are caused by disturbance to the surface of the ocean, principally by wind. This, when disturbance is created at some part of the ocean, the water in that region simply moves up and down, sending that energy in all directions. Now, waves are more localized to movement of seawater than currents. Now, don't confuse between waves and current. Now, a current will make water flow from one region to another. Whereas a wave does not make water to flow. A wave is simply a local action. The water simply will move up and down and the energy gets passed on through the surface of the sea. Now, they are created by the disturbance to the surface of the ocean which could come from wind, earthquake or undersea landslide. Any of these dist disturbances can create water to move up and down, creating ocean waves. Now, waves travel out in a circle called wave trains. You see, when a disturbance is created in one place, wave trains move in all directions. Now, each wave has a crest and a trough. Is that right? I have shown it to you, I will show it to you again. Now this is a wave, this is a trough and this is a crest. And wavelength is the distance between a crest and a crest or a trough and a trough. So wavelength is, now let me draw that diagram a little more clear, clearly for you. Now. A wavelength. Now, here you have a crest and a trough. Now, a wavelength is actually the full length of a crest and a trough. So, that is the full wavelength. Okay. Now, a wave has three distinct characteristics. What are they? A wave has a wave height. Now, what is the height of a wave? I'll, I'll just show it to you in a minute. A wave height is the distance uh, measured from the bottom of a trough to the top of a crest. That is the wave height. So, a wave has a wave height. A wave has a wave length. So, a wave length is one full crest and one full trough. And a wave has a wave frequency. What's the meaning wave frequency? Now, if a, a water particle vibrates up and down five times a second, it will produce five waves in a second. And that is the frequency. So, frequency is the number of waves produced per second. All right? So, learn about these. The wave has wave height. What is the wave height? The distance measured from the bottom of a trough to the top of a crest is the wave height. Wave length is the length of a trough and a crest together. And wave frequency is the number of waves produced per second. Now, these characteristics depend on the wind speed, the length of time the wind blows, the fetch. Now, what does that mean, the fetch? The distance across the ocean the wind actually blows is called the fetch. All these things will affect the frequency, wavelength, and wave height. 
Now, since the wind doesn't blow always in the, in the same direction, you see, wind can blow in all kinds of random uh, directions. That means ocean surface has complicated mixture of many sizes and speeds of waves superimposed one on top of the other. What you see is actually not waves created by just one disturbance, but waves created by many disturbances being superimposed on each other. And that's a very complicated pattern. The longer wavelengths travel faster and last longer than the shorter wavelength. If you have a wave that has a very long wavelength, it will last for a very long time and will travel at a faster rate. Well, this is a picture of actually waves in ocean. Now remember, waves do not transport water like current do. Waves simply are local disturbances. Now, waves created in the area of a storm get transformed as they travel away and become groups of long wavelength and low height called swells. So as the waves move away from the, from the place where it is created, eventually it sort of becomes long waves and they are swells. You see water simply, you see water simply rising and falling. And they're called swells. Now, water does not move horizontally. In fact, the waves do not make water move horizontally. The water particles simply will execute up and down vibration, creating the wave profile. Now, this is the way the water particles vibrate. Look at that. The water particles sort of vibrate along a circle. And uh, you create the wave profile because at some time water particles are here and after a little while the water particles are at the bottom side creating a trough, a crest and a trough, a crest and a trough. As the wave progresses to the right, each particle simply vibrate up and down. In other words, water is not transported horizontally. What is transported is the energy of the wave. Water itself is not transported. So each water particle moves up and down tracing a circular path. These water particles are not transported. Only the energy of the wave is transported. Now look at this uh, animation. If you put a, a buoy, something that floats in a region where there is a wave, that float will simply move up and down as you see here. This is the type of motion the particle will have. Just like the particles of water traces out the circle. Now, you see the crust and trough are caused by the positions of these particles. You see that? Now this is a trough and now this is a crest. Depending on the position of the particle, it could be a trough or a crest. Now let me see if I can show this to you on a web animation. Now here you have an ocean swell. Now watch a particle vibrating. Now this is the type of motion for a particle. And you can see the surface of water as the particle vibrates. Now you have a region of, of trough. You see that? This particle now is in the trough. And as the vibration continues, you can see the particle is now going to continue vibrating and is going to go now onto a, onto a crust. So crest and trough are created by the vibration of these particles up and down. And that is a swell. Now, I can actually change the wavelength and show you the effects of these. 
All right, let's do, use a medium wavelength. When I use a medium wavelength, look at the way the swells are changing. But the particles, again, simply vibrate up and down along a kind of circular motion. All right, what happens if I go to short waves? If the waves are short, you can see the swells, you can see many more crests and troughs. But again, the particles simply vibrate up and down along a circle, forming crest. Look at the way the crest is formed. And now the crest is passing. You're now going to have a trough. So the crest and trough continues to form. And just look at the formation of ripples. So, remember, ocean waves do not transport water horizontally. Simply the energy is transported. The water particles simply vibrate in circular patterns as I just showed it to you. All right, let's now move on. So, here is another illustration. You can see the wave height. The wave height is the distance from the crest to the trough. Now, water particles farther below also traces out circles. So, not only the surface particles, but also the particles below. <coughs> but the diameter of the circular path traced out by a particle is the same as the wave height. You see, this is the diameter of the circle that a particle traces out. This is a particle that traces out a circle of diameter same as the height of the wave. So the diameter of the circular path of a vibrating particle is the same as the wave height. Now below a depth equal to half the wavelength, there is no circular movement of the particle. Measuring the wavelength gives an indication of how deeply the wave disturbance reaches. So, if the wavelength is very long, very long, the disturbance also reaches uh, deeper from uh, deep from the surface. Now, swells do not transport water with the waves over distance. I've been saying that very many times now. Swells or waves do not transport water. You see, the water particles simply move up and down. It is the energy that get transported along the surface. Now, but a strong wind can topple a wave. Once, when a wave is swelling like this, a great wind blows against it, then the wave will break on the wind. You can see that's what's happening here. If you remember watching the Hawaii Five O very long time ago, you can see this kind of a scene in there where a wave breaks out. Now that's called a white cap. Now waves do transport water where breakers occur in the surf zone. So if a wave comes in and a breaker is on the surf zone, you can see water do get transported. A lot of water gets thrown into the shore. Now, when a wave breaks, it tosses water towards the shore where the water begins to accumulate. So when a great big wave breaks on the shore, large quantities of water are thrown onto the shore. And some of this water might return to sea by moving beneath the breakers, forming what is called an undertow. So the water that is accumulated on the shore would want to return to the sea. And if it finds a path to return, it will go underneath, forming a weak current known as the undertow. Now, other parts of the accumulated water might be pushed along the waves, producing a longshore current. Now, here is an illustration of longshore current. 
Now, what you should understand is that water has been thrown to the beach over here and most of this water could not return through the undertow. Much of it is left behind and it is now trying to return to the sea and this is the result. So, other parts of the accumulated water might be pushed along by the waves along the shore forming what is called a longshore current that moves parallel to the shore in the surf zone. And now, it can be easily recognized by watching foam or swimmers or debris near shore drift into the longshore current. Now, it's a very dangerous region. Don't ever go in it. Now, when the longshore current finds a deeper channel, so as this water moves parallel to the shore, if it finds a deeper channel, it will take that channel and return to the ocean. And this is what is called rip current. I'm sure many of you have heard about getting people getting caught in rip current. Well, a rip current is the water from a longshore current going back into the ocean. So if you get caught in a rip current, what to do is just to stay with that current for after some time it will weaken and then you can swim back. But never try to beat it. It will beat you. So this is the longshore current when it finds a, a channel that it can return, it returns to the ocean forming a rip current. The rip current usually extends beyond the surf zone and then diminishes. So, if you are get caught, you simply stay with it. It might carry you for about a mile into the ocean, but you will be safe. You will be either rescued or you can swim back. Now, look for any of these clues to identify a rip current. What are they? A channel of churning choppy water an indication of a rip current. There you are. That kind of a situation, try and avoid that. An area having a notable difference in water color, a line of foam, seaweed or debris moving steadily toward seaward is an indication of a rip current. And finally, a break in the incoming wave pattern as the waves move towards the shore, if you see a break in it, well, that could be an indication of a rift current. Well, we talked a lot about waves, so why not do a lab on waves? So let's do a study on waves. What I'm going to do is, I'm going to create waves on a string and we will look at some of the terms about waves. Okay. Now, what are some of the characteristics of waves? A wave has the following characteristics. It has a, a wave has a wavelength. We represent it by the Greek letter lambda. And I told you what a wavelength is. It is the length of a full crest and a full trough. A wave has a frequency, the number of waves produced per second. A wave has a wave speed. The speed with which the energy gets transported, V. And a relation between wavelength and frequency can be written as V equal to F lambda. So take note of that. A relation between wave speed, frequency and wavelength is V equal to F lambda. Now we're going to generate waves on a string and measure its wavelength and frequency and use them to calculate the wave speed. So, when I do the experiment, well, first of all, when you start an experiment, always hit pause and go get your worksheet. So, you must be ready now with the worksheet so that when I take measurements, you can take note on it or fill in a table so that you are ready. All right? So we will generate waves on a string and measure its wavelength and frequency 
and use them to calculate the wave speed using this relation v equal to f lambda all right let me set up the experiment for you now watch the waves i have generated on the string now what you got to do is watch the shadow of the of the wave now that's the wave can you see the crest and the trough well you can see the crest that is the crest let me see if i can get it a little more defined well there you got the crest Alright, now what we're going to do is measure the wavelength. Now remember the wavelength is the full length of a crest. Now what you see here is one full crest. So if I measure the length of that one full crest, I'll have a half of a wavelength. So, what I'm going to do is measure the wavelength and write it here, and you need to do the writing along with me. Now, I'm going to measure the length of this full crest, that is 1 meter and 10 centimeter. So, tell me if the length of one full crest is 1.1 meter, what is the length of the full wave? A full wave is a crest and a trough. So what you see here is half of a wavelength. This is a very long wave. So my wavelength is two times the length there. I've got the wavelength is 2.2 meter. And the frequency I generated this wave actually by setting the string into vibration six times a second. I have used a machine that will set the waves six times a second. There are six waves generated in one second. So what is the frequency? Now you notice that frequency is measured in the unit called Hertz. Hertz means per second. So what will I write under the frequency? The frequency is 6 Hertz. So I will write the frequency is 6 Hertz. I don't need to write Hertz there because I have already written that there. So I have the frequency 6 Hertz. I have the wavelength 2.2 meter. Can you calculate the wave speed? I'm going to leave it for you to calculate. What is the relation? What is the equation connecting wave speed, wavelength, and frequency? V equal to F lambda. So I want you to calculate the wave speed and write the unit. The unit of speed will be meter per second. All right. So this is a wave with one crest that means this is one half of a wave now I'm going to change the frequency and see how the wave is going to change watch how the wave is going to change when I change the frequency now look at this wave now now here you got a full wave now what is a full wave it has got a crest and a trough. So this is a full wave. I'm going to measure the wavelength of that. Now remember, what all I need to do is measure the length of this and double it. Or if I have a meter rule that I have, I'm going to measure the distance from one end to the other which contains one crest and one trough. Now, I know it is a little difficult for you to see on the right side because the machine is blocking you. All right, I'm going to measure the length again. The wavelength is, well, there you are. 
I got 1.1 meter as the wavelength. 1.1 meter. And what is the frequency now? My frequency is now 12. That means this string is now vibrating 12 times a second. Just like the water particles vibrate up and down, the string segments are simply vibrating up and down, creating the crest and the trough. Okay, so my frequency is 12 hertz. All right, I want you to complete the wave speed and write the unit. The unit of speed will be meter per second. All right, I'm going to now change the frequency so that we change the wavelength. All right, what, the, what happens now? Now, this is one full wave. I'm now going to change it. All right, I'm changing the frequency. Look at this now. There you are. Okay, how many crest and trough can you see? Well, this, uh, let me make it again. The machine has a mold of its own. All right, you can see a crest, a trough, a crest. So there is, there are two crests and a trough. So to measure the wavelength, remember the length of a wave is the length of a crest and a trough. So if I want to measure the wavelength, I measure it from here to here. Is that right? So I'm going to measure the wavelength using the ruler from the end there to... Well, let me put the meter rule in the proper way. The wavelength is 75 centimeter. Well, I'm making approximate measurement. Now, 75 centimeter is the wavelength. Can you give it to me in meters? 75 centimeter is how many meters? Is 0.75 meters. So, the wavelength is 0.75 meters. And what is the frequency now? Well, the frequency now is 18. This string is vibrating up and down 18 times a second. So my frequency, I'm going to write 18. Now you can calculate the wave speed and write it here. Okay, I'm now going to change the frequency so that I change the wavelength. Alright, watch this now. Alright. Can you tell me how many waves are there on the string? If you watch, there is a crest, a trough, a crest, a trough. There are two full waves on that string. To measure the wavelength, I measure the distance. I can actually measure it here, is that right? This is one full crest and this is one full trough. I can measure it from here to here. I'm going to do that. That will give me a wavelength. So let me measure that for you. Watch me do that. Now the wavelength here is, well let's see, 55 centimeter. Now the wavelength is 55 centimeter. Can you give it to me that in meters? It will be 0.55 meters. So, the wavelength is 0.55 meters. And what is therefore, what is the frequency? The frequency is 25 now. So, I've got the frequency 25 hertz. I have the frequency 25 hertz, the wavelength is 0.55. I want you to calculate the wave speed on your arm. Okay, I'm going to now change the wavelength. All right, let's see.
Well, can you see this now? How many waves are there on the string now? Well, you can see here, there is a crest, a trough, that is one wave, a crest, a trough, a second wave, and a crest. There, is, there are two and a half waves. So the wavelength is, I can take any, any crest and then the trough. So I measure from here to here will be my wavelength. Is that right? Okay, let me measure it. The wavelength, I'm going to measure it from here to here, where I'm pointing now. This is my wavelength. That is 40, 43 centimeters. Now, give it to me in meters. 43 centimeters is how many meters? Well, 0.43 meters. The wavelength is 0 0.43 meters. And the frequency is 30 hertz. 30 hertz. So the frequency is 30 hertz. The wavelength is 0.43 meters. Calculate the wave speed. And finally, one more measurement. I'm going to uh, change the wavelength. Okay. All right, watch when I change the wavelength. Let me see whether I can get that uh, right. One, two, three. Well, yes. Okay. Oh, well. All right. You can see now I can measure the distance from a crest, the whole crest and a trough, and what will be that distance? Let me see if I can get it more defined. Alright, I'm going to take the measurements now. The distance now is, alright, 36 centimeters. The wavelength I measured from here to here. I got 36 centimeters and that will be 0.36 meter and the frequency now is 35 hertz. All right. Now we have a number of frequency values and a number of wavelength values. I want you to calculate the speed each time. And I'm going to turn off this machine and let's see what we can do with these. You know, you have the worksheet with you. Now, I want you to complete the worksheet. So, all right, when I bring in my next step, all these values will go. So, you got to have these values on your worksheet. If you don't have it, you pause the video and write down these values. All right. Calculate the speed of the wave each time and find its average value. I'm sure you all know how to find the average of how many values are there? One, two, three, four, five, six. So find the average of these values and complete the lab worksheet and email it to me. As usual, when you complete a lab, now remember a lab is a simple activity just to reinforce the concept that we've discussed. And so you must do it immediately and email it to me to make sure that it is done. All right, don't put it away for another time. We will now talk about the ocean floor. The ocean floor. How does the floor of the ocean look like? And what is at the floor of the ocean?
Well, beneath the world's oceans lie rugged mountains, volcanoes, vast plateaus, and almost bottomless trenches. So the seabed is not a flat like that most people think it is. It is actually hills, valleys, mountains, and deep trenches. In fact, some of the deepest trenches are deeper than the highest mountains on the land. Mount Everest can actually fit into some of the trenches. Now, here I have an illustration of the ocean floor. How does it look? Look at the deep ocean trench. Now, the deepest ocean trenches could easily swallow the tallest mountains on land. So, the, underneath the ocean surface is a very complicated terrain. The, the Mariana Trench in the Western Pacific is 11,033 meter high. Now, that's about as tall as Mount Everest is. Well, Mount Everest is actually only about 10,000 meter high. So, this is about 11,033. If you put the Mount Everest in it, there is still, you got uh, one, one kilometer left. Is that right? That's a very deep trench. Now, around most continents are shallow seas that cover gently sloping areas called continental shelves. Now, this is the continental shelves. This is the, this is the shore as you come into the sea you get shallow and a sort of sloping area that is the continental shelf now beyond the continental shelf the continental slope this is the slope of the continental shelf you got the abyss or the ocean basin well that's the abyss in there which is the ocean basin the abyss contains plains there are plains there there are tall and long mountain ranges called ridges, isolated volcanic mountains. You see, there are volcanic mountains inside the sea. There are active volcanoes under the sea. And they are called sea mounts and ocean trenches, which are the deepest parts of the ocean. So, in the abyss, this is the abyss, you got Abyssal plains, there are plains there, there are mountain ridges, there are volcanoes, and there are deep trenches in the abyss in the abyssal plain. Now some volcanoes that rise from the ridges appear above the surface as islands. Now, Hawaiian Islands is an example of such giant volcanoes that have formed islands. Now, oceanographers know these features exist because much effort has been spent on mapping the ocean bottom. Now, how do we go and have a look at the ocean bottom? Is it possible for us to go and have a look? Well, in order to make maps of the ocean floor, the depth of the ocean must be known in many places. Now, how do we know the depth of the ocean? Most depth measurements are made using an echo sounder called a sonar. Now, what it does is it will send a, a beam of ultrasound or sound waves that will go get reflected from the bottom and will be detected. By measuring the time taken for the waves to go down and come back, we can measure the depth of the ocean. Now, here I have illustrated how a ship uses a sonar to measure the depth of the ocean. You can see a sonar waves that goes and gets reflected from, this, from the bottom. And that reflected wave is detected and the time measured between sending out the wave and getting the reflection back is the distance it travels is twice the depth and we can calculate the depth of the ocean that way 
Now the time it takes for the pulse to travel to the bottom and be reflected back to the surface is measured. From this time interval and knowing the speed of sound in water, you know that sound travels much faster in water than in air. We can then calculate the depth of the sea. Now when pulses are sent out and received in quick succession, an almost continuous recording of the ocean depth called the bottom profile may be obtained. So as this ship goes around, it is continuously mapping the ocean profile. So it can make out a map showing where is the ocean shallow, where is the ocean deep, so you got a clear picture of what is under the waters of the ocean. Well, we have uh, had a good look at the waters of the sea. What is it made of? And the nature of the waves is upright and we have a fairly good understanding of ocean waves. And that gave, gave us an opportunity to talk about the... Uh, what is underneath the oceans like. Alright, that brings us to the close of the fourth unit of our course and you must be ready for a test now. Alright, as I reminded you last time, when you are ready for a test, you must do the practice test first. And do not put off taking the test. Always keep a watch on the date the test is available and take it when it is available. And make sure that you have understood everything and keep all the PowerPoint presentations with you when you take the test. Alright, I'll get back to you with the next lesson later on.